say it's good to have Larry and Laura back with us. Mm -hmm. Good to be back. Uh, we've been watching you on Facebook, but I have to tell you, you look a lot better in person. <laughs> <laughs> Your eyes got worse, I see why you got it. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, it is, uh, I am so thankful that it's back and, and <clears throat> thankful to see that we're maybe trying to get closer. We're not there yet, but closer to, to a little bit of normalcy. But anyway, all right. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles and will, turn with me to the book of Job. Book of Job, Job chapter number one. And I do want to say <clears throat> a happy happy father's day to all of you fathers today i truly appreciate um our christian fathers and mothers who who do so much to make sure that god's <clears throat> uh, fullness truly comes out um uh, within their children as they pass that on there's um uh, there's not many greater words that you could hear than, than to hear that, that you have been a truly good example of a Christian parent. Um, because I promise you that, that you will <clears throat> make a difference in your children's lives in a positive form and fashion. We may not always see it, but I promise you it's always there. They will never forget it. And <clears throat> while um, I was praying for this message this week and, and looking for something to do, and and I was thinking about a lot of different fathers that we have all through Scripture, and, and I started to think about how as parents, lots of times <clears throat> that <clears throat> younger parents think that uh, and notice I said the younger parents because the more you're a parent, the more you get over this notion, okay? But the younger parents think that, that being a parent is going to last for, you know, 18, 19 years. Your children are going to get older. They're going to move away, and your concerns will grow less. Your parental <clears throat> advice will grow less. Your uh, parental responsibilities will become a lot less because they will move out on their own and they will begin to care for themselves and then eventually have families of their own. And so your parenting stops when it reaches that point. The older you get, the more you realize that that is all nonsense because you never quit being a parent. You never quit being a parent, no matter how old your children get, you never quit being a parent who is concerned for their children, no matter what happens, good or bad, you never quit being concerned for your children. Now, listen to me when I say the word concerned. Concerned is a lot different than worried, right? Worry <coughs> is something that will destroy your faith. Concern is something that we all have that is not for you say, that's just another way of saying worried without getting in trouble. No, it's not. There's a huge difference in being concerned that things may happen or could happen or living your life worried to death about it. A concern will put you into action. A worry will usually stop you in your tracks and cause you to start to try to decide what you can do to better help the situation. Concern puts you into action with being able to pray or to accomplish certain things. Parents are always concerned, I hope not worried, because worry will destroy your faith. Don't let worry, which leads to fear, which will cripple you and cripple your ability to trust God, place that aside. Concern is okay. But <clears throat> when I started to think about all the fathers through Scripture that we could use today, 
that, that maybe would be an example for us, I started to think, and then, and then it just kept coming back to my mind, Job, Job. Everybody said, Job. And I thought, Job is one of the most remarkable examples of what a parent, and we're not just talking about fathers, but what a parent should be. All right? Now, I'm going to try to quickly move through this because I know a lot of you got Father's Day plans and plans to do that, and my, my wife plans to pamper me for the rest of the day. It's not true, but it's a nice thought. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> so so Sean had the same thought, but he already got that blew up in Sunday school. <clears throat> but anyway, what happens is Job gives us this example of what we should be as parents. He begins, and I want us to just look, and we're going to talk about the entirety of chapter 1 and parts of through the rest of Job. But I want to just read one verse, I think, that will sum everything up, verse 1. Job 1, verse 1. He says, <clears throat> There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God, and eschewed evil or shunned evil or completely stayed away from evil. Now, this perfect does not mean that he was sin-free. All right? It meant that he was blameless before God. Now, a lot of people say, well, if you're blameless before God, then you're sin-free. No, not at all. Look at us. We are <laughs> true believers in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you and I stand as true believers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, blameless before God. Why? Because the blood of Christ covers us. Amen. Huh? As Brother Dale just saying, our sins are gone. We stand blameless, reconciled, redeemed, justified before God. All right? Because we are believers. Job had true faith. So he was the believer that he needed to be by putting his faith and trust in God. Remember, everyone in the Old Testament was found not guilty before God. How? By their faith. Do you believe God? Do you trust God? Job trusted God and stayed away from evil. It didn't mean that he was sin free. We all sin and come short of the glory of God every day. But we can live a life that is suitable in the eyes of God. So when it was saying that he was perfect, now most of the time when you get into the idea of being perfect in Scripture, it deals with the idea of reaching a maturity level in your spiritual life and in your Christian life. That's what it focuses on, that maturity level. You have grown in God and therefore you have become stronger because you have grown. Just as Paul describes it when he said that, when he was talking to the Corinthians, he said, I can't feed you with meat because you're still babies drinking out of the milk bottle. All right? Now, <clears throat> it's the same way when we think about spiritual growth, you go from the bottle to the baby food till you get into the little softer foods, until a little later you get into the harder foods, and finally you accomplish the idea of eating meat, right? Because you continue to grow. That's the way our Christian life has to unfold. You don't get saved today and know everything tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. You have to grow, right? <clears throat> so Job had grown into this man and reached a maturity level, and that's not what perfect was referring to more as it's translated from Hebrew. It's more about being blameless. Amen. Not having, and when I'm talking about blameless, okay, it's not, it's not the idea that you are blame-free from everything. It's, <clears throat> it's more of an understanding that when you stand before God, you have been found
come to be acceptable in God's plan, right? Truly blameless. Having an understanding that you have grown into something that is more. Now, this is where Job had reached. Because he trusted God, then his relationship with God was very strong. Now, what you see is because Job was close to God, it didn't mean that his children were. He was, but his children weren't. But because of some of the things that Job did, it made a difference in a positive manner for his children. And that's where we need to think about who we are. And it doesn't matter whether you have children or you don't have children, whether you're younger, whether you're older, whether your children are grown and you're dealing with grandchildren or great-grandchildren or whatever it may be. It has nothing to do with that. This is about how we have a true relationship with God that helps us to become more. And God gave us an example. Here is a man who was blameless before God because he lived the life that he should. He had reached a maturity level that took effort. It took time, and he had grown. Now, <clears throat> when you're thinking about your children or your grandchildren. Every one of the anchors that they have that hold them stable and give them the stability of life, whatever those anchors may be, the legacy that they one day will leave normally comes from the moral character of their parents. Right? It's like if you live in a household where you never go to church and you never have any influence of the Lord whatsoever in your life, that does not excuse you. But it means that the moral character of your parents, if they sin against God and do immoral things every day, then most of the time that's the direction that you first go off into. Is an immoral direction. The anchors and the stability that you have in your life is based on immoral things from an immoral character that was taught to you by immoral parents. Right? And so you tend to follow that. But if you have moral parents who raise you in church, who give you an idea and an understanding of what is right, that they live a moral life, then your anchors and your stability usually tend to be more rooted and grounded into morality, kindness, love, compassion. Those are normally the things you pass on. Now, it doesn't mean that if you have immoral parents that you can't become moral yourself, that you're doomed as some psychologists would like for you to believe that it is genetically given within you to be this person because your parent is this person because your great grandparents were immoral, then that automatically says that you are going to be immoral and that you are going to have these same addictions and these same problems and these same struggles. That's the way it works. But scripture tells us that God begs to differ. That Jesus Christ can change that person extremely simply if they will just trust him and change. Their morals become different. They are new creatures created in Christ Jesus. What kind of legacy, <clears throat> this is a question that we have to ask each of ourselves individually. Like I said, it's not just parents. What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? 
When the Lord takes you home, what kind of legacy do you want people to have to say about you? How do you want to be described? Is there enough proof in your life that people can describe you as Job is described in the word of God? Blameless, upright. Someone who stands before God accepted. That stands before his children accepted. That stands before the world as a person who was more, a legacy that is left behind. A lot of athletes want to be remembered for a play they made or a game they won or a thing that they've done or a trophy that they have or something that was accomplished. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But is that the only legacy that you want to leave behind? Or do you want people to remember your moral character and describe you as they describe Job? Well, see, to be described like Job, Job didn't work for a description. Job wasn't focused on a legacy. Job was focused on serving God. Period. He wasn't looking for blessings. He received blessings. Right? Now, did you hear me? The problem is, is that when we serve God, most of the time, if we're doing what we think we should be, then we stop within ourselves. We become a little selfish and we start to say, oh, well, what am I going to get? What are you going to give me, God? I've given you, okay? I went to church and I listened to that long-winded preacher for two hours. Now, what you going to give me back? What am I going to get for putting in my diligence? What am I going to get for spending my time? Job wasn't looking for a blessing. He received it. He had seven sons. If you read on down through, he had seven sons, three daughters. <clears throat> he <clears throat> was extremely rich, had all kinds of camels and oxen and donkeys and servants and he had everything he could ever imagine. Now these were blessings from God. Not because he was seeking those blessings but because God had blessed him. Now let me remind you <clears throat> what God promises us today are heavenly blessings, and that's what we need to focus on. Not material things, but blessings that God has given us that are heavenly spiritual blessings. Remember, your spirituality, no matter what people try to define to you as being spiritual or being in the spirit, okay? A lot of people, oh, God loves us when we go to churches and they talk about being in the spirit. Okay, and it's defined and described as you act this way or you do this or you hoot and holler or you jump or you talk this way or you walk this way. Being in the spirit, being spiritual defines your relationship with God, period. Man. Okay, Man. that's when you know you are spiritual. If you have a developed relationship with God, then you are spiritual, all right? You are in the Spirit because the Spirit is in you. Amen. God in you. God with you. It's not defined by actions. It's defined by a relationship that you have with the Lord, which therefore causes you to have moral actions. Right? You want to live for God because you love Him. You want to to let your relationship with God grow because you enjoy the relationship that you have and you want more of it. It's like reading the word of God. If you pick up the Bible and you get nothing out of it 
and you don't have a desire to pick it back up and study it again later, then your relationship with God is broken and you need to find a place and fix it. Okay, You need to get that relationship fixed because the more you know about God, the more you want to know about God. The more you hear his word, the more you want to learn what he has to say. It's just like any relationship. If you fall in love with somebody, you want to spend more time with them. You can't help it. You just want to. You have that desire within you because you have all these emotional feelings where you can't help but to grow in that relationship with that person because your love is so much for them. But then we say, well, I love God more than I love anything. But yet that's not what all what our actions show. Because we have no desire to know what he says. We have no desire to know how he expects us to live our lives, what he expects us to do. We have no idea how much he truly loves us because we don't desire a better relationship with him. And then you say you love God more than you love anything else. Honestly, bluntly, boldly, that's a lie. Because if you want to love God more than anything else, you want to develop a better relationship with him, just like Job. Right? <clears throat> what kind of legacy are we going to leave? We're going to be blameless and upright people, people who are moral, because that's what God expects. This was something, this was a man that God was extremely pleased with. Stop and think about that. Extremely pleased with. Right? But his children had a problem. If you read on down through there, you see they had big feasts every once in a while. More often than not, all the brothers and sisters would get together and they would drink and party. They just had a good old time. Wasn't hurting nothing. Daddy's rich. Daddy's got money. Don't matter. Daddy's got a good relationship with God. Doesn't matter. Now, they weren't bad people. They weren't bad people at all. You can't find that in Scripture to find that, that Job's children were horrible, wicked people. They liked to get together. They went to their own house. They didn't go out in the public and party and go crazy. They just did it amongst their own brothers and sisters and immediate family members. They just they didn't do it to shame dad or anything else. And was it really even bad? People didn't know. They were just getting together and eating as far as most people knew. But Job had a funny feeling about the things they were doing. Apparently, he didn't think that what they were doing was good. So what did he do? He gave us another example of what we do when we become concerned for our children. He wasn't worried about what they were doing. He was concerned about what they were doing, and he took his concerns, and he began to pray earnestly. He began to be intensely devoted to his children in prayer with God. He didn't say, God, make them stop feasting. His concern was that they were doing something that was wrong and against God. So he would pray. Then, as was normal at this particular time, under the laws and ideas of keeping a relationship with God, he would make sacrifices for his children just in case they did something wrong. But the whole point is, is that when he became concerned, he began to talk to the only one that he knew could fix it. He said, God, you're going to have to help these children because I've done what I know to do. I've lived my life the way I'm supposed to live <laughs> in front of them. I've done the things that are necessary to be called a good father. The Lord himself called Job blameless and upright. All right? So he said, I've done my part. They're grown. Now you're going to have to do what you can do because I can't do any more than what I've done. Have you ever felt like that as a parent when you've reached a point when you say, I can't do any more I've done? All I can do as a parent, 
I've lived my life. I've taught you everything that you should do in life. But you still struggle. What's supposed to happen? You ever, <coughs> you ever seen those families? <coughs> I had a family, thank the Lord. I had a brother who, who was addicted, and he'll tell you, he, he was, my younger brother was addicted to drugs, which thank God he is off of and completely free of and all of that stuff now. But we were raised by the same parents. We were raised in a Christian home. We, we had the same things, the same opportunities that he had, I had, my big brother had. Right? There was nothing wrong with the way our parents raised us. They raised us correctly, perfectly. But yet, he made a wrong turn. He made a wrong choice. Now, did that make my parents horrible parents? Now, sometimes my parents felt like they were horrible parents because it's like, what happened? They didn't do anything wrong. They showed us the right way. The mistakes I made in my life, that's my fault. One of my parents, they taught me the right way. I was raised in the house of God. Did I always follow God? Absolutely not. Did we have problems? Absolutely. That's one of my parents' fault. They were great parents. They taught me everything that I needed to know to live my life in the right way. They taught my brother the exact same thing. And at some point in time, we made different decisions. But, you see, my parents lived the example they were supposed to live. So, <clears throat> when your children do those things, that's when you get to a point that you have to just be intensely devoted to God and to Him and say, God, this is you. I've done my job. I'm not patting, you, I'm not patting yourself on the back. It's like, Lord, I did what you asked me to do. <clears throat> now you're going to have to help because I can't do it. That's what Job taught us. This is what we have to do. It's like, Lord, I don't know if what they're doing is wrong or not. I don't know where they're at. I don't know what they're into. But I am concerned because it doesn't look like they're doing the right thing. Give it to God. Give it to God. Something else that Job did when you get down there about verses 9 and 10, this is one of the greatest pieces of scripture that we overlook so much. <clears throat> My dad taught us this when we were kids, and I guess I've always remembered this because I can remember so many times when I was little and my dad used to pray and he would say, make me a hedge around my family. Let me be the gap in the hedge that I need to be to help my family or others or let me stand in the gap to make up the hedge. We get this idea from Job right here in verses 9 and 10 when you're looking at it because Satan goes and he God asked him, he said, have you looked? He said, where you been? He said, I've been walking up and down the world, messing with people. That's what he's been doing. Doing what Satan does. <clears throat> and God said, have you been by Job? Because he knew that Job was strong. He was faithful. And Satan says, he trusts you for nothing. Because you've blessed him with so much. He has no reason to complain whatsoever. He has no reason to curse you. He is healthy. His family's healthy. He has all these camel, all these oxen, all these donkeys. He has everything he ever needs. Got money. Don't you have blessed him so much, he has nothing to complain about. He said, but you take that stuff from him. He said, I promise you, he'll curse you before the day is over. And God said, <clears throat> if that's what you think, then you can go and give him a test. But what did Satan say to him? He said, I can't touch him. I can't because you have a hedge built 
around him and his family. You have a hedge built around him and his things. And so <clears throat> God said, okay, go ahead. You can have anything that he, you can have control over anything that he has, but you can't mess with him. Now we know later God gives him permission to even mess with Job without taking his life. You can do anything else, but you can't take his life. Job got boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. But what happened to Job? He remained faithful. But here's the next thing that he gives us, that we need to spend more time as we pray earnestly that God will build a divine hedge around us and around our family, around our church, that God will bless us so that we can become more and that he will place that divine hedge on us so that Satan can't bother us. When was the last time that you ever prayed for God to place a hedge or a protection around you that Satan can't aggravate you to death every day? We spend more time being selfish and caring about everything that is going on in our life is a lot more important than anything else anybody else is dealing with. Nobody's had the problems I've had. Nobody's suffered through the things I've suffered. Nobody's dealing with the situations that I deal with. These are mine. They may be theirs. Their problems are their problems. But this is my problem, so it's more important. And that's what we're taught in today's world. <clears throat> It's about time you put yourself first. Okay? How many times do you hear that? You've got to put yourself first. You've got to take care of yourself above all. You have to do things for you. Don't worry about everybody else. That advice is against God. It is against God's advice. Because God's advice is that you must care about others more than you ever care about yourself. If you want to have true joy, break down the word joy. You can write it down. This is the way it works. Jesus, others, you. Right? Not you, Jesus, others. That don't spell joy. You're not going to have any kind of joy in your life. If you put yourself first. But what we are praying for is a hedge for God to put a divine protection around us so that we can be Satan free. So that we can go out and have a true relationship with him and grow in him to become more. And then the last example that he gives us, I'm going to hush, I'm about done. But the last example thing that he gives us right here is that we have to trust God, all right? Trust God even when things don't go well. In the course of a few minutes, all right, Job lost everything. Not in the course of a day, in the course of minutes, he lost everything that he had, all of his riches. All of his children, everything that was of any earthly importance to him, besides his wife, he lost. His servants come to him, and before they get done speaking, another one comes. First one comes and says, the Sabians have come, and they've taken all the oxen and all the donkeys. And the Sabians are a group of people who were in the southeastern part of what we know today as Saudi Arabia. Then he talks about the Chaldeans coming, and we know that the Chaldeans later become the Babylonians, so they're in the place where we know, which is northeast of in the Middle East, which is where we know as Iraq today, in the northeast portion of Iraq. All right? But <coughs> anyway, <clears throat> they come. They take everything. While he's still talking, another servant comes and said, they've come, they've taken all you camels. All this stuff happens. Then the last thing, while they're still talking, minutes have passed. 
The servant came and said there was a great wind that came out of the wilderness, tornado, whatever you want to say. And he said it tore down the eldest son's house because they were over there feasting. And it tore down the house and you've lost every one of your children. In a matter of minutes, he lost every piece of riches that he had. It was gone. It had either been stolen or destroyed. Now remember, part of his sheep were destroyed by fire out of heaven. And everybody says, oh, well, God did that. Really? Who had control? Satan, remember? Then the great wind, they said, oh, God did that. Who was in control of that at that particular time? It wasn't God. It was Satan. So don't think that Satan can't affect nature. That's just a little tidbit in there for free. But let me tell you, <clears throat> That during all of this entire process and all the struggles and all the troubles, what did Job do? He ripped his clothes. He shaved his head because that was a sign of mourning. And then he fell down. And what does it say in verse 21, 22? That he fell down and cried and begged and pleaded and blamed God and said, why? Why, God, why did you do this to me? And he whined and went on, rolled around in the floor. Nope. You know what he did through all of this? It said that he fell down and worshiped God. Think about that. Do you have a relationship if you lose everything you have? Put yourself in Job's situation. If you lose every possession that you own, and not only on top of that, you lose all of your loved ones, the people that you care about the most on this earth, what are you going to do if that happens to you? How strong is your relationship to God? Will you blame God? Will you <coughs> step away from God? Will you torture yourself? Will you go around always saying, why me? Why me? Why me? Or will you fall down and worship God? And he said some of the words that we all know and remember. He said, I came out. He said, naked I came into this world. Naked I'll go out. He said, the Lord is given. He knew where his blessings came from. That's the point. He knew where his blessings came from. Those possessions that he had, they were blessings from God. The children that he was so blessed to have. They were blessings from God. He said the Lord is given and the Lord is taken away. But he didn't say, why God? He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. He trusted God. He trusted God. Even when things went bad, he still trusted God. Now by the end of this book, he is enjoying more blessings from God than he had at the beginning. More children than he had before. All right? Because God took care of him just like God will take care of you. But it all comes back down to one important thing. Job had a strong, developed relationship with God, which made him blameless and upright. His relationship with God gave him the ability when trouble came to overcome. 
Are you willing to pray? Are you willing to pray for that hedge of divine protection? Are you willing to trust God even when things don't go well? Because that defines your relationship with God. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. I want you to just search your own heart this morning for a second. Just look within yourself and say, what would I do? Faced with the same situation as Job. Now, if your answers don't match up to Job's, then I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand and say, pray for me because my relationship with God needs to grow. Amen. 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 Hands everywhere. Thank you, Lord. Now, <clears throat> as we all see our weakness, Let's turn that weakness into a better relationship with God as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. God, as you saw each hand that lifted toward you, God, as we see within ourselves our weakness, God, as we know that you are the Almighty, Lord, we pray for a more developed relationship with you. God, we pray that you will place within our hearts a desire to become closer to you. God, we pray that we would love you as you would have us to. God, we pray that our relationship with you will grow daily, that we can become more so that we can do more. God, we want to stand before you as blameless and upright. God, we want to be caught serving you. Lord, we want to have the moral character that the world can see that they would want to come and to be a part of your life. God, we pray that you grant us these things this day. Give us the help that we need to become closer to you. And we'll give you the honor and glory for it all because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.